Uh, hello everybody and welcome back to uh, Oakwood Cemetery. I hope you've been with us for a few of our virtual tours. This is number 12. Uh, we are here on a beautiful if chilly fall day. Uh, in fact, uh, so chilly that Robin's uh, camera may shake a little bit. As we go, that will give us moving pictures. So. <laughs> But we're here, I hesitate to say, under a beautiful Carolina blue sky. And I hate to say that because our topic today, <laughs> our topic today is uh, NC State Part 2. If you were with us last week for our last time for virtual tour number 11, we did NC State uh, Part 1, which took in the, the founding of the university in the older years. Uh, today, we're going to move forward to uh, NC State in the more modern era, though I certainly won't, wouldn't say current, but um, we're arbitrarily using the World War I era as a dividing line between old and new, and some of the themes that we follow for the new are uh, changes to the curriculum and campus, they're almost natural, uh, the arrival of big time sports, and there's a third major change, and here's a little quiz for you, figure it out would be the third major change at NC State um, uh, that you can see now that you couldn't uh, before World War I. Anyway, that's why we're at the uh, uh, gravesite of the Riddick family, in particular Wallace Riddick. Uh, <clears throat> he is the third of the heads of NC State that uh, we're talking about. Uh, here is the photo of Wallace Riddick. Robin getting a nice close-up. Uh, Wake County family, he went off to Wake Forest University for several years and then transferred to UNC. He's a Carolina boy, a Carolina graduate. Um, and then he went off to Lehigh up in Pennsylvania and studied engineering and came back to uh, North Carolina, practiced civil engineering in the area and then joined the faculty at uh, North Carolina A&M. Um, when uh, D.H. Hill Jr., whom you met on one of our previous uh, tours, uh, retired, uh, Wallace Riddick became the president of uh, NC State. Uh, and he served from during the World War I years. In fact, a lot of the changes that we see that distinguish old from new NC State, I think can be traced back to the Riddick years as the uh, president of the school. Uh, in terms of curriculum, it was under Riddick that the various um, areas of study became broken down into schools, the School of Engineering, School of Textiles, and that sort of thing, a little more firmer uh, uh, division of colleges, if you will. Um, and in fact, when the School of Engineering was created, Riddick retired from the presidency and became the head of the School of Engineering. He also, for a time, as a faculty member, coached football uh, at NC State, 1898 and 1899. And when they, they built a new uh, football stadium, again, some of our moving pictures here, <laughs> uh, and, it, and uh, named it uh, Riddick Stadium. And um, <clears throat> of course, it was replaced over the years. The last piece of Riddick Stadium came down in 2013, I believe. Um, anyway, a handsome field, which sort of fits our uh, one of our themes of the arrival of big time sports at uh, at uh, NC State. Um, anyway, uh, Riddick, uh, as I said, finished up at State as the uh, head of the School of Engineering, and there are at least two. Today, there are at least two tangible uh, uh, souvenirs, if you will, of Riddick's Day. Uh, one is the bell tower, the cornerstone of which was laid in 1921 to honor dead during World War I. And the other is the technician, the newspaper. The newspaper technician is 100 years old this year. Uh, well known, uh, I suppose, for things like the nude picture of uh, UNC basketball coach Dean Smith, but um, the technician, a famous part of, uh, a well-known part of NC State for the last century. Anyway, Wallace Riddick, 
certainly a man who uh, had an impact on the school. Uh, we've come across the cemetery from the Beechwood section over to the A section for the fourth of our uh, leaders of NC State. As you can see, this is John William Harrison, Colonel Harrison to, uh, to many. Uh, he was the son of a tenant farmer in, in uh, Cleveland County. Uh, another one of these, uh, well, you'll meet another one in just a moment, uh, self-made people. Um, rose from a very um, unacademic, if you will, background to uh, the head of a major state university. Um, Harrelson uh, came to NC State or to NC A&M, uh, studied math and stayed on to teach math at NC State and uh, became the uh, head of the school in 1933. Now he was not officially the president. In fact, initially he was called the Dean of Administration and later the Chancellor. We remember him as Chancellor Harrelson. And the reason being that in 1931, the state of North Carolina reorganized its universities into the University of North Carolina system. And there were three schools in the original system. That was UNC Chapel Hill, UNC Greensboro, and North Carolina A&M. And he became the chancellor, if you will. In fact, the first alum, the first alum, alumnus of NC State to head the school. Uh, under his leadership, uh, almost uh, two dozen new buildings were added. The faculty increased four times. So you can see a, a university really on the move. Um, he uh, had an unfortunate uh, uh, death. Uh, it was during the dedication ceremony of the D. H. Hill Junior Library in 1955. He was a speaker there and passed away during those ceremonies. So, uh, in a way, he gave his all to his school. Uh, he was remembered as Colonel Harrison because he spent a great deal of time, some 20 years, in the U.S. Army, mostly uh, in the reserves. But um, that was a part of his background, too. Harrelson Hall was the round building that was built on campus in his memory. Uh, but I, I haven't been to campus for a long time, but I gather that it's been torn down. And uh, some people honestly won't miss it. I think the, its shape made it inconvenient to use, but uh, certainly a nice memory of uh, Colonel Harrelson. And here is a photo of him. It's one of our small ones. Robin can pan in on that. All right, John William Harrelson. Uh, Robert and I have come back across the cemetery to Beechwood um, to uh, talk about someone we've already uh, presented on one of our earlier uh, virtual tours, and that's Clarence Hamilton Poe, a stone that's a little difficult to read, especially here in the shade. But like Harrelson, uh, brought up uh, on a farm. And uh, always, uh, so agriculture always had a particular interest to Poe, uh, and um, thus his interest in NC State. Uh, he, um, again, as we told you earlier, uh, became an editor as a teenager of the Progressive Farmer, a periodical, eventually took over that periodical. He had a choice of going off to college to Wake Forest or to take over the editor editorialship and eventually ownership of the Progressive Farmer, and he chose to stay with the paper. But he was self-educated. In fact, he, in his autobiography, says that school came to him. In what sense? Books. He was an avid reader. He read everything from tech manuals to the classics and schooled himself that way. Um, uh, but his connection to NC State, his formal connection, he became the chairman of the executive committee of the Board of Trustees for 15 years. And not just any 15 years, these were the very years that we're talking about after World War II and into the early, I'm sorry, after World War I and into the early 1930s. Uh, Poe, uh, in effect, headed uh, the uh, executive committee of the Board of Trustees. His honorary degrees, he, he had more honorary degrees than uh, I have fingers and toes. He's just a remarkable person. Um, and if we've mentioned him two or three times, he's well worth it.
my arts Hamilton Poe. And we've come just a few steps from Clarence uh, Poe's gravesite. Um, if you were with us last time, you remember this man. This is Frank Martin Thompson. Uh, he uh, came to NC State class of uh, 09, a great athlete, a baseball player, a football player, in fact, a coach uh, for a time at, uh, at NC State. Uh, he uh, is not with us here in Oakwood. He went off to fight in World War I. He was a machine gunner with the U.S. Army on the Western Front, and that's where he died. Uh, as far as I know, he's buried in France. His family is still here. His father, uh, John Thompson, uh, a uh, judge, highly respected in town. Much of his family is here with us at Oakwood, but he's not. But as we said last time, uh, when we mentioned uh, Frank, uh, he's something of a symbolic figure in terms of what we're talking about today. Why? Because when NC State built a new gymnasium in 1925, they named it for him, the uh, Thompson Gym. Uh, and it became the focus of, again, the growing interest in sports at NC State. Here's a photo. I think this is a wonderful picture. Robin's gonna linger on it for a while. On your left is the Thompson Gym, and on the right you see the steel skeleton of what is Reynolds Coliseum, or in fact what will become Reynolds Coliseum. Now Reynolds was begun before World War I, but they had to stop construction of it because of the need for war materiel, and it wasn't until 1949 that Reynolds Coliseum opened up. But uh, again, you see the transition that NC State is making to big time sports. Well, what were known as the NC State Farmers, with the early basketball teams, for instance, became known as the Red Terrors later on because they became so good at the sport. And we're going to say more about that in just a moment. But in terms of symbolism, I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, Frank Thompson um, is uh, remarkable. All right, we're in Hillside North now to uh, continue with the uh, theme that we began with uh, Frank Thompson uh, and the Thompson Gym. Uh, and I don't f think you'll find a, a, a better example, really, of uh, the evolution of NC State basketball than where we are now. Uh, at the graveside of, of uh, Ronnie Shavlik. Uh, from Colorado, he came to play basketball at NC State, the class of 1956. He played for Everett Case, who was known as the father of ACC basketball. Uh, Ronnie was um, twice an All-American, a rare accomplishment, I think, 1955 and 56. He's in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, after he left NC State, he played for the New York Knicks for a couple of years and then retired from basketball, came to Raleigh, uh, began a business, as far as I know, still going strong in the hands of uh, still in, uh, his family runs it, and um, very active in the community. Uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, the Wolf, he's a wolf packer, of course, but uh, Ronnie Shavlik, a great example of um, the growth of big time sports at, uh, at NC State, a thread that will continue on. Photo. Oh, photo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Good picture of him. Boy, born basketball player, I guess, if there ever was one. And from Ronnie Shavlik, we uh, move over to, to uh, Jimmy V. Uh, again, maintaining that basketball tradition um, that became so characteristic of NC State. Um, what can we add about uh, Jim Valvano? Our, um, one of the most popularly visited graves, I'm sure that's poor grammar, in, uh, in Oakwood Cemetery, certainly one of the most asked for. Um, and you can see uh, 
just from um, a quick glance, people often leave things, uh, mementos behind, just to say, I've been there, I visited you. And, and uh, in fact, one day we found a note out here. Uh, somebody had written it in longhand and said, I've been driving around. I've been contemplating taking my own life. And I stopped by uh, Jimmy V's gravesite and remembered what he said. Uh, what an inspiration he was, and I've changed my mind. In fact, we put that in a plastic sleeve and left it here. We thought it might be of interest to other people, and um, it didn't stay here long. But uh, anyway, he certainly had an impact far beyond the basketball court for many folks. Um, I think remembered uh, for two things in particular. Number one, that uh, 83 NCAA championship game and that uh, final dunk by uh, Lorenzo, and B, uh, his talk at Madison Square Garden just before he passed away. That's the one where he did write his own epitaph. If you will, take time every day to laugh, to think, to cry, and you've had a full day. So uh, certainly um, a lot more than just the basketball, I think, uh, going on here. Now, and now, we remember him in many ways, one of them, of course, this little button that the cemetery has in its shop, Bury Me by Jimmy V. A lot of people seem to appreciate that. Anyway, let's go visit Lorenzo. All right, speaking of that uh, 83 NCAA Finals game, um, you see just a few steps from uh, Coach Valvano, who's of course the man who made that dunk. Lorenzo Charles, uh, recruited uh, for NC State uh, in 1981. In fact, called by sports writers the sleeper of the year. That is a player with great talent who was uh, not recognized for it right away. But uh, Lorenzo, recognized for it, came to NC State. Uh, Played in that NCAA uh, game in 83, made that shot, made a name for himself uh, with Coach Valvano running around the court looking for someone to hug. Um, Lorenzo will forever be remembered uh, by it. Uh, a stone here that in effect mimics uh, Jim Valvano's in its style. Uh, a clock here provided by the NC State Wolfpack Club. Uh, Lorenzo uh, from NC State went on and played with the Atlanta Hawks for a year or so, and then uh, went into state and professional ball, but not with the NBA. Retired in 1999 and went to work for a Raleigh bus company. And as you're probably aware, he died in a, in a uh, bus accident. Uh, several years later. Uh, but again, Lorenzo Charles uh, right here with his coach and with a nice inscription that I think was provided by his sister. He's a teacher in one of our area schools. And a photo. There he is. Again, a reflection of big-time sports at uh, NC State. All right, basketball isn't the only big-time sport, of course, played at NC State. Uh, they also have an uh, outstanding uh, soccer program, and when you talk soccer, at least in recent years, you're probably talking about uh, Root Basizo. Uh, who played for the team from uh, 2008 to 2011. He captained the team uh, his senior year, uh, led it to uh, NCAA, NCAA ranking and a, an invitation to the uh, to tournament. Um, but uh, he himself uh, went on after NC State to play for the uh, Railhawks uh, here in North Carolina. Um, and uh, 
to a longer professional uh, career. But uh, Farouk had a very interesting uh, personal history that we'll uh, talk about. And let's uh, move around to the other side of the stone. You see the memorabilia that's been left here. Uh, his uh, fellow soccer players from NC State participated in his funeral service. <clears throat> but he's remembered for many things besides simply his skill on the soccer field. He was a tireless worker uh, uh, to improve his own skills. And he had, had an interesting uh, family history. He was uh, originally from Palestine. Uh, lived in Tunisia for a time and came to the U.S. and played locally here at St. Dave's, an independent school. He led that school to a state championship uh, for several years before going to uh, NC State. Uh, here's a photo of him. Now, this is one of Robin's favorites. And take a look at his left arm there. Uh, he had great uh, loyalty and pride in his heritage, uh, very uh, fond of his mom. And that uh, symbol on his arm is the same one as is on his stone here. And it apparently means in Arabic, my mother. That's her name on the stone uh, above it. So a man with an interesting personal history, a wonderful uh, career as an athlete. Uh, as I said, he finished up uh, uh, with uh, uh, intending to play for a Finnish uh, professional soccer team, was on a family vacation in Prague, and was killed there by an accident, uh, ingested uh, carbon, monox carbon monoxide poisoning in the place that he was staying. A rather tragic end to a fellow with a fine future indeed. Um, anyway, Frank Preciso, Farouk Preciso, I should say. All right, we're in the hex section now. Uh, I asked you, uh, I had a little quiz for you at the very beginning of this talk. That is to name uh, the other great change at NC State uh, since its founding. We've talked about curricular and campus changes. We've talked about the coming of uh, big time sports. And I asked you for yet another one. And if you said the arrival on girls of girls on campus, of females on campus, that was the answer. And when you're talking about females on campus at NC State, you're talking about Jane McKimmon. She, the first female, to uh, receive a degree at NC State, and that wasn't until 1926. So a lot of history had, had uh, passed before females came to state. She was a Raleigh girl. She uh, initially went to Peace Institute. In fact, she was for a time the youngest graduate from Peace Institute. At 16 years old, she went off and taught school for a while and then left the workplace and raised a family, and then went back to school, back to state, became associated with the uh, North Carolina Agricultural Extension Service, and began traveling the state, teaching rural women in particular how to manage a household. Everything from preserving uh, foods to, um, I guess, anything it took, sewing, how, uh, household finances, anything that it, uh, she could convey to help them run a household. Um, uh, she retired uh, in, uh, and published a book, A Story of Her Life, in 1945, When We're Green We Grow. Uh, you may know her best through the uh, McKimmon Center for ex uh, Extended uh, Learning. Uh, at NC State. Uh, we remember her here, uh, among other things, with a button like Jimmy V. There she is. The tomato clubs were what they called the home economics group that she would form um, 
uh, to uh, to teach these skills. And there's that picture, a little larger picture over her in, in later years. Um, but highly, highly respected uh, uh, fine lady, Jane McKinnon. All right, we're in the cremation garden now, uh, next to the uh, mausoleum, to talk about a remarkable man, really named Ronald Lawrence Mace. Ron Mace, uh, originally from New Jersey, as a boy, he uh, contracted polio, and as a result, by the time he was nine or ten, had become a paraplegic. Uh, eventually moved south, went to uh, NC State Architectural School, but he was in a wheelchair. And that meant that while he was at State, he suffered all the indignities and embarrassment that went with a disabled person trying to make around a facility that had no provision for disabled people. In fact, the story is that his mother would uh, park the car on campus if he had to use the restroom, for instance, she would drive him somewhere that was more accessible than what he had at uh, in uh, school buildings. So this became uh, very important to him as an architect. Uh, when he left state, he went into business as an architect and began to design for people with disabilities. Um, he, uh, in fact, became a consultant uh, for uh, municipalities with, uh, with building codes so that they would put in the building codes provision for disabled people. Uh, he is credited with coming up with the term universal design. Now understand universal design. He realized that some of the provisions that are made for disabled people would be useful to anybody, disabled or not. For instance, if you ride a bicycle through a curb cut, a, that's an example of that. Uh, someone without a disability is making use of a special design, uh, in this case a curb cut, uh, to make life just a little bit easier. It makes life a little easier for people without disabilities, but it makes life a whole lot easier for people with disabilities. Um, so you can credit Ron Mace with a good deal of, of, of these things that we come to, uh, I think, uh, take us uh, every day now. Uh, handles instead of doorknobs on, uh, on doors, curb cuts that I mentioned, buses that kneel, things that we can all take advantage of but that are particularly helpful to uh, folks with disabilities. Um, he started a center for uh, universal design at NC State. I'm not sure it's active now, but um, it resulted in, in, in uh, the extension of this concept. Uh, he, uh, he and uh, Lockhart, uh, his uh, companion, Lockhart Mace, uh, they would ride around the Oakwood district where they lived that, that abuts Oakwood Cemetery and wheelchairs and uh, seemed to have a wonderful time. Um, the house where they lived had all the features that uh, that would be uh, uh, convenient for disabled folks. Uh, showers that one can take their wheelchair in, uh, uh, light switches and plugs at a proper height for uh, someone with uh, uh, who's in a wheelchair, all the things that would make life easier. Um, for them. Uh, Ron Mace uh, was renowned for his uh, work for disabled people. He won a presidential award one year and in fact the cemetery has honored him. This is the Ron Mace uh, cremation garden. Oh, thank you Robin. And a photo. There he is. A great picture. And we're back in Hillside North to finish up, uh, in this case, with an NC State faculty member. We wanted to finish uh, on a nice high note here, very positive note. Uh, Gilbert Smith, 
from Texas originally to NC State via Baylor, uh, Tulane, and Brown Universities. Uh, he taught Spanish and Spanish uh, literature at NC State. But um, the reason we finished up with him uh, is because it's such a, a positive, uh, such a positive fellow. Um, people seem to love to be around him. You can see uh, on his stone um, that a uh, very active, uh, wonderful personality. And I think the stick figures probably are symbolic of something more specific than we know about, but to me anyway, they portray someone who really loved life. And um, that's one reason why we wanted to end with it. And another reason is because it demonstrates the diversity, how far NC State has come from the days of an, you remember when we uh, gave you information out of the 1903 Agrimec yearbook. Um, it's hard to imagine Spanish literature being much a part of the curriculum in those days. Perhaps it was, but uh, I, I don't think so. But um, Spanish literature now, among other things, certainly a part of a diverse curriculum with a diverse student population and a diverse faculty at NC State. Uh, a long history of uh, of growth and um, uh, of service to the people of North Carolina. So thank you, Gilbert Smith, and thanks all of you who went to state and uh, for all that you do. Thanks for being with us today.